Say praise the Lord. Okay, let's continue our study on uh, Exodus. We're going to be doing chapter 24 tonight, okay? <clears throat> Let me read it to you first, okay? Let's go to Exodus chapter 24, starting on verse 1. Then he said to Moses, go up to the Lord. Now, take note of the company that God wants to be with Moses. You and Aaron... Nadab and Abihu and 70 of Israel's elders. And bow in worship at a distance. You remember Nadab and Abihu, right? Anybody remember them? What happened to them? They died. <laughs> because they opened a strange fire. But here, they were called to go up the mountain with Moses. Moses alone is to approach the Lord, but the others are not to approach, and the people are not to go up with him. Moses came and told the people all the commands of the Lord and all the ordinances. Then all the people responded with a single voice. We will do everything that the Lord has commanded. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early the next morning. And set up an altar and twelve pillars for the twelve tribes of Israel at the base of the mountain. Then he sent out young Israelite men and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Why did, why did uh, Moses send the young men and not the elders to offer the sacrifices? Huh? The bulls are heavy, okay? So, so that's the only reason for that, okay? Don't, don't think deep, okay? That's how people mess it up, okay? <laughs> then, uh, he, he then, Moses took half the blood and set it in basins. The other half of the blood he splattered on the altar. He then took the covenant scroll and read it aloud to the people. They responded, we will do and obey all that the Lord has commanded. Twice now they made that pledge. Moses took the blood, splattered it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you concerning all these words. Then Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and 70 of Israel's elders and they saw the God of Israel beneath his feet was something like a pavement made of lapis lazuli. What is that? Lapis lazuli. Sapphire. Okay, it's sapphire. As clear as the sky itself. You know, when God travels, his, his, uh, his foot pillow is sapphire. God did not harm the Israelite nobles. They saw him and they ate and drank. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay there so that I may give you the stone tablets with the law and commandments I have written for their instructions. Moses arose with his assistant Joshua. Earlier, Joshua was not mentioned, but now he is mentioned. And went up to the mountain of God. He told the elders, wait here for us until we return to you. Aaron and her are here with you. Her was not also mentioned, right? But then, obviously, he's there. So two, uh, two names that, that, that went up but was not mentioned. <clears throat> Whoever has a dispute should go to them. When Moses went up the mountain, the cloud covered it. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses from the cloud. The appearance of the Lord's glory to the Israelites was like a consuming fire on the mountain top. Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain, and he remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Now, you notice in chapter 20, the Ten Commandments were given, okay? Other laws were given. And then, we look at the preparations to enter the promised land. 
All of these are, are, the, are progressions developing. Prior to that, they were in Egypt. They saw the hand of the Lord through the manifestation of the ten plagues of Egypt. So at this point, there is already depth in the knowledge of God to the Israelis. They know God some already. I mean, they know, they know God better than everybody else on the face of the earth. And in fact, we can argue they know God more than some of us know God. Because they have seen the physical manifestation of His presence, the glory of the Lord. Can you imagine cloud smoke covered the whole mountain? And uh, it was a phenomenal, phenomenal showing forth of uh, the glory of the Lord. So, after all of this, I call this chapter pivotal because this is actually when God called Israel to make covenant with him. So the title that I made for this teaching is simply Informed Covenant Making. After all of the teachings, after all the experiences, now he is asking them to join in covenant with him. And this is one of the things that we need to understand from God. He doesn't want us to enter into a covenant with him ill-informed. Okay, God cannot bless ignorance. God is the God of wisdom and, and understanding. And so, because he has knowledge, he has wisdom, he has, he has understanding, God doesn't want us to be ignorant of his ways. Now, you, you look at Deuteronomy 28 in, in the repetition, because, of course, for 40 years they failed to enter the promised land. God repeated everything again. And after they were well informed, Joshua, in his, uh, at the end of his life, says, Choose you this day whom you will serve. New generation. Every new generation, the four, after the 40 years of wilderness wandering, the entry, and then Joshua's end of life, there, there is always a writing of the covenant, a reading of the covenant. There is always an information being given to the people, and after information is given, then God is asking are you going to enter into a covenant? Yeah. And I think that explains why there's a lot of shallowness in the faith life of a lot of Christians today. That's become religion. Because a lot of the people now are ill-informed. For example, uh, what uh, my, my wife told me, 57% of uh, so-called Christians agree with, uh, what's that same-sex marriage, huh? Uh, Same-sex marriage, 57%. Ah, so many, so many means of going to heaven. That's ill-informed. Now, can you imagine how in the world are you going to enter into a covenant with a God if you know there are other ways? They were well-informed, and this is, this is what, what we need to understand. That's why we are called to make disciples. A disciple is a well-informed individual in the ways of God. Now, what is amazing, if, if a person says, well, I don't know Christianity is like this. Well, this is how you should live. This is how you should go. That's why, that's why the, uh, the teaching of the Word becomes very important. The reading of the Word be, is very important. So our, we, are not approaching, we are not approaching the, uh, the uh, covenant with God ill-informed. I mean, for example, if I was, uh, I was, I was, go to, I was, I was going to school in the Philippines for my master's. And uh, our church decided, because I need a degree, they, they're going to pay for it. But there's a contract, okay? For every year that you, uh, you are given a scholarship, you have to work two years. That's why I paid for it, because I don't want to be bound by any of that. But, but you're not, you're not going to walk in and say, well, I don't know that. That's not allowed. You know? it, it's like some people who are being hired for work. I didn't know I'm going to do that. That's why sometimes in our job descriptions, there is a cluster that says, and anything that your supervisor tells you to do. Because nobody is possibly going to, uh, to be able to tell you exactly everything that you're going to do in, the, in your company. And so there is that clause. And you sign on that, you're going to be paid so many dollars per hour, and you signed on that, that is the agreement. And, and you are well informed. Now, our contracts also stipulates, for example, if, uh, if, you, are, if you are caught uh, doing this, you can be fired. I mean, for example, among the athletes, these are very detailed contracts. If you are an athlete making 
making uh, $45 million a year. There's a clause there, guaranteed $20 million. If you don't show up for a practice, $200,000 is deducted. You know, so, so a person may have a $40 million contract per year, he may end up receiving only 30, okay? Because the moment he violates some, automatically, and nobody walks in and says, I didn't know this, you ought to know. You ought to know. You know? Some of you bought, bought a house, and your lawyer walked, walked you through it, and the lawyer will demand, these are the conditions, because you are supposed to be well informed. That's covenanting. So sometimes it becomes counterproductive when you just witness to somebody and tell them, give your life to Jesus. And they are wondering, what am I gonna, where, where am I going to give my life to Jesus to? They don't know what they are walking into. And we, and we force people. We force people into entering into something that they don't understand. Now the same thing happened in marital covenant. A lot of people enter into a marital covenant without knowing what's going on. One of the biggest mistakes I made in church is when I was uh, uh, an interim pastor for a church in Iowa, Lake Mills, Iowa, because I was in charge of uh, finding their new pastor. I checked everything that I can check. Uh, academics, ministerial record, you know, family. I failed to ask one thing because I am not an American and I, we don't think this way. I failed to ask for his credit score. <laughs> yeah. It turned out credit score is very important in the U.S. Well, after I left, the church uh, kept in touch with me for a few months. The pastor will stand up every Sunday and ask for money. Ask for money. It turned out he was heavily in debt. So they were hiring a pastor that was heavily in debt. And you know what pastors who are heavily in debt do? Uh, they convict people to give. Because they are heavily in debt. I have, seen, I have seen a choir director. Uh, she, she was a, a pastor and she could not pay her bills. And so they were practicing choir and she said, if I don't pay my, my, my rent and my utilities, they'll kick me out of the house. And, and so collected an offering in a choir practice. Yeah, so all, all those manipulative things. That's why all of these things come into play. You know, you remember during the, the presidential debate, they were being asked, what are you going to do with the pipeline? Oh, in and out, in and out, the voters are ill-informed. Well, some, some voters, even if you inform them, they are just ill, you know? So it, it doesn't really matter. But, but uh, now people, uh, Pastor Gina was telling me at uh, Trinity, because of this abortion thing and all the other things that uh, Biden uh, issued an executive order, he was telling them, why are you complaining? He said, this is what you voted for. We already know he's going to legalize uh, he's going to make uh, abortion international. What are you complaining for? And then Pastor Jim told me, and he told them, this is what you want, and you are Christians. You see? And this is what you call as being well informed. Now, God did not tell them, enter into a covenant with me without informing them. No Israeli can say, I do not know. No Christian should also say, I do not know. Now, you can translate that into marriage. You cannot, if, if you have done your due diligence, you can't say, I do not know. <laughs> because these are the things that we should be knowing before entering into a covenant with him. In fact, we know that a little later, Jesus will celebrate the first <clears throat> new covenant meal. Now take note. After three years, he taught them, he called them, he sent them, Everything, they have experienced persecution with him at the end, just before he died, uh, something like 24 hours before he died, he said, let's enter into a covenant. In fact, he waited until Judas left because Judas already backslid. The 11 remaining disciples were well informed before they entered into a covenant with him. And so, this teaching on informed covenant making uh, should be applied to us. Nobody, nobody should enter <clears throat> their faith life ignorant. Okay, God cannot bless ignorance. In verse 1 to 8, God called them to go up to him. So to enter into covenant with God, first we have to go up to him. God doesn't go down spiritually. He, we, we go up to him. It's, a, it's an uplift. God will never lower down his standards. God doesn't change. Okay? There is a theology called process theology. It's an ever-changing God. Uh, God changes all the time, okay? 
This call once again came after the giving of the law, after a long time that God has now been dealing with them. <clears throat> By the way, do you know that God can give you a call? But after God gives you a call, He will not let you do a lot of things unless you're informed. Yeah. I have a teacher in the Bible school before. She got saved and she said, the first two years of my Christian life was like a honeymoon. She said, I, I, I was just like floating on air. She said, God, she was a missionary to the Philippines. She said, God told me to go to the Bible school. I went to the Bible school. She said, God told me to do this. I do this. She's like a honeymoon, she said, for two years. And she said, during that time, I immersed myself in the word. I, I've seen things. I've seen God move. Then she said, after two years, God told her to start doing something. And she said, it's just like the honeymoon is over. She said, I didn't know that Christianity requires commitment like this. But she said, at that point, I'm well informed. You see? For example, if, if persecution takes place right now, nobody should be surprised. He who wants to live godly shall suffer persecution. If you say, well, you know, I thought everybody's going to be my friend, then you, you're, you're well informed or you're ignoring the basics of Christianity. This is what faith life is. It's a distinction from the world. Now, there are certain personnel whom God wants to go up with Moses and meets with him. First, Aaron was once again called up. Remember in chapter 19, verse 24. Let me read it to you again. Starting on verse 23. Moses responded to the Lord, The people cannot come up Mount Sinai since you warned us. Put a boundary around the mountain and cons consecrate. And the Lord replied to him, Go down and come back with Aaron. But the priests and the people must not break through the camp to come up to the Lord, or he will break out in anger with them. Now, remember what we learned in Exodus. Originally, God wants all the people to, to, to be with him. But for the people to be with him, God says, these are certain things that you cannot do. In fact, even before the consecration, there can be no sexual relationship between couples. I mean, these are the things that God says. I want you to be clean. And then, but the people start, kept rebelling. And so when they were all day in Mount, Mount Sinai, God says, no, you cannot. You cannot or I, can, I will break out in front of you and you'll, you'll die. Now, you will understand why, why with what we read in chapter 24, Aaron... The seven tailors can't go up. Because remember what happened prior to this. What happened was they, they broke the covenant. They have, found, they have made themselves unworthy to approach further in the presence of God. How do you press closer? You keep doing what God wants. That's why in the company of, of believers, there are some people who really just press closer. Among the women that I know, Catherine Kuhlman, just press very close to God. Not a good teacher, you know, not a good preacher, but a boy, she was very powerful, operating the word of knowledge. But if you look at her life, all it is about is, is close relationship with, with Jesus Christ. I mean, there are certain courtrooms that you will not be allowed in, even as born-again people. Because there is a certain lifestyle needed. Uh, that means your spiritual life has to translate into your daily lives. If all we are doing is saying things but not doing that, then the faith is dead. And so we know that Aaron did not get up. Now this time, Nadab and Abayu were called up. These are the siblings who were struck uh, dead in the presence of the Lord for offering strength. What happened to them? By the way, Nadab and Abayu were uh, the eldest. After them is uh, Ithamar and Eleazar. They were not even called, you see. So God honors his word. And so he said, Nadab, Abayu, you're the eldest. <clears throat> One of you, Nadab is probably going to be the next high priest, not Eleazar. What happened to these two? I'll tell you what happened to them. They got close to God and they take the presence of God for granted. This is the danger among children raised in the church. Yeah. Now, now, listen, this is a warning. If your children are raised in the church since, since they were in their mother's womb or since they were little kids, that's the problem. They take the church as an ordinary thing. Remember, one of the same in the Bible is do not take what is God's as common. That's why I keep, I keep uh, telling everybody, don't let your kids play in the church. Running up and down, they begin to take the church like your living room. 
and in the process, they lose respect. Yeah. They lose respect. One time I've seen, uh, I hope nobody's doing it now, uh, in the sound room, some people before, while the service is going on, raising their feet on the table and sleeping. I mean, I will be standing here before, and I'll see them, and they just don't care. You are beginning, uh, some of those people backslid already, you are beginning to take the presence of God for granted. That's why I may be strict to my wife. It's because she is my wife, very close to me. She can take the anointing for granted. And she can take the presence of God for granted. The same thing with my kids. That's why I'm very strict with them. You know, I want them to worship. I want them playing video games while I'm teaching. Some of you adults are playing video games while I'm teaching. Do not take the presence of God for granted. But the moment you start taking the presence of God for granted, then you begin to ignore the obvious commandments. Not even the Bible did that, you see. Now, they were drunk one day. Some, some Jewish commentators even says they begin to bring prostitutes in the house of God. Now, can you imagine you are son of Aaron? You begin to bring prostitutes in the house of God and say, well, you know, Aaron is my dad. Nadab says, I'm the next high priest. I'm going to be okay. No, you're not. Your dad may be foolish and weak, but not God. So, offer the strange fire. God is struck them down dead. And listen, after God strike them down dead, um, Eleazar and who's the dad? Aaron were forbidden from mourning. Because you cannot approach God not only empty handed with a sour face. Yeah. God wants joyful people worshiping Him. God doesn't want our long faces during worship service. Pastor, is that in the Bible? That's in the scriptures. Enter his courts with thanksgiving and praise. And you can add other scriptures with joy and festivities. And some people think they look spiritual because they come on the presence of God with long face. God doesn't want that. Are you here? So don't come in the presence of God. God doesn't like that. God wants us to be joyful. These are all stipulated in the, in, in the scriptures. You see? Nadav and Abayu is a classic example of leadership kids who were ignored by their parents. They can do whatever they want. End up not worshiping God. Yeah. By the way, I, I tell that uh, even to Joseph when, when, he, when he was here. Hey, Joseph, you know, you, 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 you have to be worshiping. This is playing drums. You can fall asleep playing drums. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to be worshiping. Huh? And then I, 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 will, I will look at DJ because she's, she's, she's with the team. And if she misbehaves and, and I think she's not leading properly, I'll talk to her. She's my daughter. You know? And, and not because I'm their, their dad and I have an anointing, it doesn't exempt them from serving the Lord with all your heart. This is what happened to Nadab and Abayu. They, they ignored the presence of the Lord. Amen. Listen, do, do not take the presence of God for granted. The 70 elders were also called up. These were probably the same 70 who started prophesying in the camp whom God gave the Spirit to. Again, what happened to them? They cannot go up. Because every time there is trouble, let me ask this question. Where is the 70? Have you noticed that? These are 70 titled leaders. Every time there's trouble in the camp, where's the 70? Useless. That's why God doesn't run his church through a committee. He always runs it through a man, through his man, through his word, and through his spirit. You know? Religion keeps insisting, oh, it should be run by a group of people. It can't be run by a group of people. That's what happened. 70 on around 3 million population. That sounds about all right. But every time there is trouble. You know, sometimes we just uh, put the blame on Aaron when Moses went up. And what about the other elders? They are family leaders. They did nothing. They did not stop their children from dancing before the devil. Now remember, they were, they were having orgies. They did not stop their, 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 uh, their men and women from having sex in the camp without being married. 
They never stopped them from having orgies in the camp. While Moses, while Moses was up on the mountain, but, and, and you have seen the mountains of Israel, they are not spectacularly tall. Okay? Mount Makiling is taller. Mount Apo is, more, is, is taller. Okay? They can see the, people, the top of the mountain. Moses can hear. Joshua can hear the noise in the camp. What were the parents doing? What were the elders doing, the so-called leaders? Nothing. Useless leaders. They can't go up the mountain. Yeah. Now, they have seen all of these. That's why only Moses can go up to the mountain. And Joshua. Not, not perhaps very close to Moses, but Joshua was there. He was on standby, okay? Now, question at this point, where is Eleazar and Ithamar? I don't know, maybe they're washing dishes. Yeah. Maybe they're like David, ignored, because they were young. Oh, but these two, especially Eleazar. Remember, Eleazar was a, was a very zealous young man. He had seen... You know, well, as far as my family is concerned, if an elder, if an elder sibling does something, the younger corrects. Yeah. I've noticed that. If you teach them properly. If Ann says something or does something that is not right in the side of my kids, you know, sometimes my wife will scream, but they will tell me, Papa, is that right? And I'll say it's wrong. Yeah. I have to say it's wrong. They will notice there is a certain zeal that developed in the heart of Eliezer. What's the most zealous thing that he did? Come on, you know this. What's the most zealous thing? The what? The javelin. Whom did he kill? Yes, they were having sex, a Moabites and uh, a Jewish man. And God already struck the, uh, the camp, right? And Eliezer, seeing the evil of his, of his brothers, took a javelin and killed them both. You know what God says? I am pleased. That's what he said, I am pleased. Now again, you translate today, a lot of people are doing evil things in the house of the Lord God is not pleased. The parents ignore. The leadership ignore. The same principle. We cannot possibly enjoy proximity with God and be able to ascend up into the, tam into the mountain with him if we ignore these things. Oh, but, but I don't know. Maybe Ithamar was, was one of those shy uh, guys, you know. Maybe he had seen enough. But Eliezer says, my brothers are not going to be qualified. Man, he, he took a javelin and, and killed those whoring couple, you know. Now, Moses told the people all the commands and ordinances of the Lord again, summoning them to enter into a covenant with God. This is one of the elements of covenant making. There are, there are stipulations like Deuteronomy 28, uh, the blessings and the curses. This is what's happening. That's why when a person gets born again, we tell them, if you, you want to give your life to Jesus so that you will, your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. After that, you abandon the life of sin. Jesus is now Lord over your life. You pray, you read your Bible. We say those things. You go to church. Okay? You renew your mind. And as, as we proceed with our discipleship, because of course you can't do that in one sitting, you begin to add more teachings from the Scriptures and you begin to say, you do the following things, you do the following things, you do the following things. Now they have seen the hand of the Lord. Today we also see the hands of the Lord. Through what? Through the miracles in our lives, gifts of the Spirit, both the, uh, the distributed gift, gifts, the nine gifts, and the appointed gifts of the Spirit. Appointed gifts being the, those in the full-time ministry. Okay? Ephesians chapter 4. And then 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. So having, having seen all of that, these are, these are manifestations of... Uh, of, of the presence of the Lord. Now, this is how people answered. 
Their answer with a single voice is, we will do everything that the Lord has commanded. No, that's English, okay? That's English. And, and English is, is always short of what the Hebrew language actually convey. Because in the Hebrew language, it actually reads like this. All that the Lord has, we will do all that the, all that the Lord has spoken and all that he will speak, we will do. That's, that's, that's the literal Hebrew. All that the Lord has spoken and all that he will speak, we will do. As the Lord said to us, these things we will do it. For additional instructions in the future, we will also do it. They were making this commitment. That's an intelligent decision. Why is it an intelligent decision? They have seen the hand of the Lord through Moses. They have seen the ten plagues. They have seen the Red Sea parted. They have seen the soldiers, the elite soldiers of Pharaoh killed. They have seen victories. They have seen provisions. They have seen water. They have seen manna. They have seen all of this. I mean, you'll be foolish to say, no, I'm not going to serve God. You know. I'm like, no, you, 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 you'll be foolish. I, mean, I, I told you when, when I was in, in, in Antipolo studying, I was getting sick because I was, I was also a, ch a children's minister. Uh, I was studying in two schools, and I was sick that night around 12 midnight. We were, I was in our apartment, and I was just I entered our apartment. I was just standing like this, and I was feeling self-righteous. I was telling myself, how many young men my age will do what I'm doing? I said, I'm finishing up electrical engineering and I'm finishing up Bible school. I'm teaching in the Sunday school. I'm teaching in the children's church. And I was a deacon during that time. Yeah. So I said, I said how, many, how many young men will do this? And I was saying, that's called, if, if you understand spiritual things, that's self-righteousness. When you begin to think you're very good. I was sick and, and uh, don't have enough money. So I was just mumbling that to myself. Oh, and, and those, those were one of the times when God just, just shocked me with his voice in my spirit. And God did not even address any of my concerns. He just simply told me, it is too foolish for you to quit now. Mm. And the moment he said that, something flashed in my mind. I mean, just, just like, like, like something flashed. I remember some of the blessings of the Lord in my life, the prayers that were answered. And I just realized it's too foolish to quit at that point. You see, I was well informed. Okay, so some of us, if we will pay attention to the, to the kind of prayers that God answered in our lives, provisions. I mean, some of us were, were, were dead set on serving God before something happened, you know. So they said, and this is normally what happens when you make an altar call. People sometimes just ignorantly say, yes. <laughs> well, this is not an ignorant response. They say, all that the Lord says we will do and everything else that he will say later, we will do, Okay. After this, Moses, another element of covenant making. After this, Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, when there are covenanting parties and there are stipulations, both parties will write down the stipulations. So they're doing everything here. Well, writing also helps you memorize. Uh, the, the word of, but by, by the way, if, if you're not doing it, that's why journaling can be very important. Yeah. I don't give away my Bibles. The ones they use for my devotion. Because I, I, I don't, I don't, I, I like buying Bibles like this. Now, this is not my Bible, this is DJ's Bible. Okay. The reason why it's DJ, DJ's Bible is because the letters are very small, you know. Uh, I always buy Bibles with wide margin on the side. Okay. Now, there's a phenomenal thing that is going on right now. You can now buy what you call a digital Bible. You can put it in your iPad and you can write as many notes as you can. Yeah. I have a Bible that I have not broken yet uh, because I'm finishing up this Bible of mine. But the other Bible that I have right now, uh, something like 19 volumes, uh, on, on, one, on this page are the letters, this is just blank. Then you can, you can write. And then at the end of my Bible, I, I put there, because normally you have, you, have, uh, you have blank pages, right? I put there some of the things that the Lord told me, you know. Like, I, ha I have a Bible wherein there is a note there when, when John talked to me and, and, and said, 
I believe God is calling me to the ministry. Because I knew God was, he told me God was calling him uh, even before the church knew. Yeah. I think it was a couple of years before the church knew. But I wrote it down. And I, I wrote some prayers there. And so I don't give away those Bibles. Because you look, you look at your Bibles where you journal and you can trace the progress of your communication with God and the blessings. My wife have, have, uh, have journals. She has, she has a list of prayer requests that we have. Yeah. One of the, one of the, the only thing in the list that, that, that has not happened yet is building a university in the Philippines. The, the others have already been fulfilled. So we can go down there and say, whoa, the Lord did the Father. Do some journaling. Yeah, write down. Amen. Amen. You, you know how to write, right? Okay, so you do that. <clears throat> and so he wrote it. Then Moses sent young men to offer burnt offerings and sacrifices. Again, another element. You will find in covenant making the reading, the writing, and then the, uh, the sacrificing. Okay? Remember when, when Abraham entered into covenant with God, the, the birds were cut in two. And then there's like a smoke. God put Abraham immediately to sleep because you're supposed to walk together. They're supposed to clasp their hands and walk between dead bodies, carcasses. And they, are, and they will be pronouncing... If I violate the, stip the stipulations of this covenant, may what happened to these animals happen to me. At that point, before Moses, uh, before Abraham walked, God gave him a sleeping pills. No, not sleeping pills. Just put him to sleep, you know. Uh, some of you may quote me literally. No, there were no sleeping pills. God just put him to sleep. And God alone walked. Why? Because God knew that if Abraham walked, he will violate. And he has to die. So God took it upon himself. He walked by himself. By that time, God swore an oath. I will never forget Abraham. I will never forget my covenant with Abraham. That's why you will find that even in the New Testament, the name of Abraham is mentioned. God swore an oath to himself. He will never forget Abraham. Yeah. And God will never violate the covenant, so he, he alone, he spared, he spared Abraham. And in verse 8, Moses took the blood of the sacrifice splattered it on the people, declaring that this is the blood of the covenant. Today we are washed with the blood of Jesus. And so now Moses and the team went up to the Lord in verse 9 to 18. Again, Nadab and Abayu were Aaron's eldest son. The 70 elders were with Moses also. These 70 elders should have done something phenomenal. By the way, what happened to the 70 uh, uh, disciples that Jesus sent? The same thing, right? They did mighty things. After that, what happened? It seems like they disappeared. You know, even among the deacons, who, 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 was the, who were the most popular among the deacons? You have uh, Philip became an evangelist. Stephen died. <laughs> you see, not everybody became, not everybody just, not everybody pressed closer. Yeah. Because again, we, we settle for too little too soon. We speak in tongues a little bit. We say, I got it made. No, you didn't. You, know, you pray for somebody one time, say, whoa, I can pray. Oh, you drop it. You, you're barely starting. You witness to somebody, you're very happy. Your ears are clapping. Well, there, there's, there's more souls to be won. You see? <clears throat> They saw the God of Israel when they went up. Beneath his feet was something like a pavement made of a sapphire. God did not harm the nobles with Moses. Uh, and, and by the way, I will not teach it tonight. And I don't know if I will teach it, but study on your own the concept of seeing God, the progress. You know, how God walked with with Enoch, he was talking with, first he was talking with Adam, and then the frequency was uh, diminished. He talked with Cain of all people. 
and warn Cain. And then after that, in the Old Testament, you will begin to see God, just his voice. Even the prophets, a prophet will have two or three revelations, and that's it, you know. And this is a common message. God will appear and says, don't be afraid. The people begin to be filled with fear. Why? Because they detach themselves. Their fear is, there is no more fear of them among their enemies. Their enemies don't fear them anymore. Remember what we studied last week? Uh, the fear of the Jews were among their enemies. But this time they were no longer afraid. And so <clears throat> what happened was the message, it is I, don't be afraid. And then you, you, that was repeated. And then in the, in the uh, Old Testament, sometimes you will see these manifestations of smoke and all of these things and visions. But then in the New Testament, the next, after four, almost 400 years, God did not speak. And then the Baptist broke uh, the silence. And then the next appearance of God is, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That's for everybody to know, okay? When, when will be the next time that the world will see God? What did the Bible say? How do you know they will see him? What if they were sleeping? And they will see him. And they will see him whom they have pierced. That's the next time. The next time. God has always been wanting to reveal himself. He showed himself. Paul said in Acts, the crucifixion of Jesus was not done in a corner. But the next thing is when he comes back. And they shall see him whom they have pierced. And, and God has always been wanting to show himself. Then after all of this miraculous thing, what did the elders do? They ate and drank. What is that? Covenant meal. You see, there is the reading, there is the writing, there is the blood sacrifice. Now there is the covenant meal. That's why the Last Supper, we call it the Last Supper of Jesus, not ours, okay? It's actually a covenant meal. Last Supper is, is a religious term. It's actually the first Covenant meal. Yeah, the first communion. And millions of communions had, had happened, of course. But that was the last uh, suffer of Jesus on earth where disciples like that. As a covenant, okay, he did not break covenant meal with them again. It was not Jesus' last meal on earth, though. Okay? When was the other time he ate? fish. Yeah. Inihaw na isda. Yeah. yeah. Inihaw na tilapia. Yeah. Then God, after this, all of this were, were done, God called Moses up. He, I, I think if, if we are there, I would like to think if we are there, we will feel jealous. Right? But that, these people doesn't seem to, to care. They already ate and drank, you know. But Moses went up with, with uh, Joshua. As Moses rose up, his assistant went with him, Joshua. How oh, this is another great lesson in training, humility, and study. Joshua had been a big part in all of God's activities for the Exodus. What, what is the characteristic that Joshua has? He will be told to do something, he will do it, and then what will happen? Joshua will be asked to do something, he'll do it, then what will happen? He disappears. Yeah. He is, he is the servant that Jesus spoke of in one of his parables. Went on the field, come home, and says, prepare my meal. Well, I'm just doing what I was told. That is the perfect example of Joshua. Joshua is that kind of person. He doesn't take the limelight, although he's always being pushed to it. And for 40 years, it's like that. Moses, what do you want me to do? Okay. Kill enemies. Okay, let's kill him. <laughs> he will, after that, he's gone, right? Okay, Moses, what do you want me to do? Well, be a spy. Can you imagine he could have, he could have said, I'll be the general for your army. Why, why send me as a spy? No complaint. Just 
sent a spy. Came back, good report, disappeared again. It's like that. For 40 years, he's been following Moses, following Moses. After 40 years of discipleship, the old generation is gone, and Moses needs to find a replacement. Who's the other one that seems to be qualified? Caleb. Why was Caleb not chosen? Well, both of them are old. I mean, why was Caleb not chosen? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. Let's not speculate, okay? But he was not chosen. But it was Joshua. You know, sometimes we think that Joshua was very excited. It must have been a surprise to him. It was the anointing that carried him. Sometimes if, we, if you think your training is long, think again. The other thing that I saw is when Moses, when, when, when Joshua was serving Moses, there was no hint in the scriptures that he coveted the position of Moses. Who coveted the position of Moses? Aaron and Miriam. Why? Proximity. Joshua was not a relative. He was a servant. Listen to me. In serving God, be careful with your relatives. Who discouraged David when he was about to kill Goliath? His brothers. Who discouraged Abigail? Nabal. The husband. Yeah. Be careful with your relatives. Especially your relatives who does not know the Lord, who doesn't know His word. They will discourage you. Yeah. They will discourage you. The first person who told me not to go full time was the one who won me to the Lord, my kuya. Yeah. My kuya was rebuking me. Why will you go to the ministry? Why? He was the one who, who, uh, who, who brought me to the Bible school. But he was the one who told me, don't. You see, if you're not careful, the, your relatives, those that you think are closest to you, will be the ones to discourage you from uh, moving f- forward. Can you imagine this? Well, Moses was the bunso. He was the youngest. Who was the eldest? Aaron. So his kuya and his ate. Moses was the youngest. And maybe after Moses brought them out of Egypt already, they says, eh, bunso lang namin yan eh. Why will, I, why will we continue this? Oh, Aaron, ikaw ang kuya, ako yung ate. You know? Don't do that. God doesn't, God doesn't operate like that. Again, if you are not careful, your closest relatives will be the ones to stop you from serving God. Okay. But Joshua gave us a true meaning of humble servants. Moses gave further instructions to the elders and then went over the mountain, told them, okay, you guys are going to be in charge. If there's, a, if there's dispute, you're going to be handling the disputes until I return. What happened when he went up to, to the mountain? You know, the glory of the Lord came. He entered. I, I, like, I like this uh, statement. And it's always being used. He entered into a, the cloud. How do you enter into the cloud? Have, have, you, have, you been, have you walked in the mountains when the cloud is low? Do you enter into the cloud? Where do you knock? All right. But the entering into the cloud doesn't literally mean the cloud, but the glory. He... When he saw, he can make a distinction. He can make a distinction between the natural cloud and the manifestations of God's presence. So he saw the presence of God. Now, there are different reactions to the presence of God in the scriptures. How did the people react when they saw the presence of God? They got scared. How did Moses react when he saw the presence of God? He got more hungry. He got excited. In fact, he just doesn't want the presence. He wants to see the face of God. 
he felt like God is covering his face with his presence, with his cloud. So I want to see your, your face. So when it says, it's, it's, like, it's like this is the cloud. Aaron, um, uh, Joshua is here. The people were left somewhere, the leaders. And, and Moses learned from God, take up the sandals of your feet for the ground that you're standing is holy. He knows the distinction. He knew when he stepped in, he's stepping into the presence of God, the Holy of Holies, so to speak. So he told, he told uh, the people, hey, listen, when there's a problem, the 70 elders will be in charge, okay? I'm getting in there. And they can see it. I'm getting in there. It was a very, get this, it was a very deliberate decision to enter. It should also be very deliberate on our part to enter into his presence. There's a song that we used to sing. Uh, what's the song? Into the Holy of Holies. What's the lyrics of that thing? Uh, take me into the... No, no, no. Take me in. Yeah, there's outer courts, right? There's, there's another court. But take me into the Holy of Holies. The, Entering in the presence of God is a very deliberate thing. Some are being raptured into it, but you decide. I will enter in the presence of God. That is one of the preparations that we should be making when we are coming to the worship service. That we are saying, I will enter into his presence. I will enter. David knew it, said, I will enter into his gates with thanksgiving. I will enter. Now we know that David did not go into the Holy of Holies. He was, his, uh, his place is relegated to the courts of men. But he said, I will enter. There is, there is this knowledge, I am entering into the presence of God. So he entered. Did God speak to him right away? Did God speak to him right away? He entered. What happened? Did God speak to him right away? Did God speak to him right away? No. Six days. On the seventh day, God spoke. Why did God make him wait for six days? Huh? This, these are some of the things that you know, people take the presence of God and say, well, if you want to enter the presence of God, you say, in Jesus' time when you're in. Not like that. Not like that. There are preparations. Now, listen, Moses was very holy. He entered into the presence. He's already in the presence of God. For six days, 24 hours a day, God did not say anything. Mm. On the seventh day, God broke silence. Now, this is already Moses. This is the guy who stood in the presence of God more than once. And yet, even he himself has to make preparations. God has to prepare him. Now, some of the books that I have read concerning people whom, whom God enjoined in his presence, they'll tell you one thing. It's, it's not them. Yeah. Uh, they testify of being caught by God into his inner sanctum, as they say. Yeah. And they say, it's not something that you can achieve. It's something that God gives you. You live right. You do right. You follow the command of the, the, the word of the Lord. And then one day God may just surprise you. Jack D. Rear of the book, surprised by the voice of the Spirit. There's an element wherein God will just rapture you. You see? But you see that is where the faith comes in. None of us have arrived. Don't, don't come into the church saying, well, I know how to worship. Most probably you don't. Okay? Because those who know how to worship has has a yearning for more because you are pressing. The moment that yearning is lost, you're backing off already. Because you know the, 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 the passage, oh, taste and see it, the Lord is good. It's, it's, again, it's not a good translation. Oh, taste and keep on tasting. That God is continuously good. That's what actually. Have, have you eaten something? It's good. Mm. But 
pagkatikim. Patikim pa nga. Meron pa ba? You know? That is what is being conveyed here. God will let you taste. When you say, oh, taste and see, a taste is not a full meal. It's like going to a Chinese, uh, not buffet, uh, Chinese store, you know. And there's this with, with a toothpick. You don't know if they have used it already or not, but the toothpick has some, some nuggets, right? Say taste. Because they were hoping the moment you taste, they'll, you will ask for more. And the reason why God says, oh, taste and see, that's all we can do. Even if you are exposed to His presence, that's all you can do. Because we still have our fallen flesh. That's why a person who experiences the presence of God will continue to have that yearning. You'll press closer. You'll pre- press closer. To the extent that God says, if you see me, you'll die. Moses said, I don't care. I want to see your face. By the way, God always says, I'm not going with you. No, 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 you're going with us. And God always says, okay, I'll go with you. I'll send an angel. No, not an angel. And God, okay. After God says, I want to see your face too. There, there is this relentless pursuit. The man who has been exposed to the presence of God on whom the spirit of Jehovah manifests himself. Just keep pressing. Yeah. That's why when a person begins to behave, I know it, oh, you're digressing. Yeah. You're, you're, you're regressing already. A person who experiences the presence of God will keep pressing and pressing and pressing for more. Amen? There's something tonight? Are you going to press in? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's all stand. Hallelujah.